Hi, the hell you boys and girls out there in podcast land. Today we are running a repeat of one of our past episodes, as I am currently in the process of moving again. Also, as I reported on the podcast earlier, I have recently become the blog editor for Frame.io, so that's been keeping me pretty busy. Lots of great stuff over at blog.frame.io, so check that out. In the meantime, enjoy this blast from the past, and I will be working on and putting out a season finale for this season, as well as for making a documentary. So, without further ado, on with the show. Enjoy. I brought you a special present. What is it? Open it up. A book? That's right. When I was your age, television was called books. I have no doubt you recognize the opening scene from one of the most universally loved movies, perhaps of all time, Rob Reiner's 1989 classic, The Princess Bride. A love story filled with action and adventure, danger and despair, pirates and princesses, and of course, true love. That day, she was amazed to discover that when he was saying, as you wish, what he meant was, I love you. And even more amazing was the day she realized she truly loved him back. Just like the young Fred Savage character in A Princess Bride, we all love and are captivated by a good story. No matter if it's a fairy tale recited by your dear old grandpa, a 70 millimeter cinematic opus on the silver screen, or a moving fundraising video for a worthy cause. A good story has the power to transport you and hold you captive. A good story can make a three plus hour movie feel like no time at all has passed and leave you wanting more. Whereas a bad story can make a three minute video feel excruciatingly long. I always end my show with the slogan, if the story sucks, I don't care what you shot it with or cut it on. But what makes a story not suck? And where do you find good stories to tell? And why is this topic so important, whether you're a filmmaker, an author, or a small business person? Today we're going to explore these questions and hopefully discover some answers. I'm Ron Dawson, and this is Radio Film School, A Filmmaker's Journey. Hold it, hold it. What is this? Are you trying to trick me? Where's the sports? Is this a kissing book? What is it about a good story that draws us in? And why is it that it connects with us as humans as much as it does? The concept of Dramatica is that over time, storytellers have figured out how to communicate very subtle but important concepts from an author to their audience. That's Chris Huntley, co-owner of the Wright Brothers, makers of Movie Magic Screenwriter and the Narrative Story Development Program and Theory Dramatica. I used to work at the company back in the 90s when it was Screenplay Systems. I was VP of Operations before they sold their popular Movie Magic software line, then Downsize. They kept the writing tools, one of which was Dramatica, which is a, a theory on what makes a strong narrative story. Chris is one of the co-developers of that theory. Here he is again. And these have essentially developed to be the fundamentals of story forms or storytelling. That that stories are little models of how we problem solve. And that's one reason why every person, every audience member is an expert at story. They can tell when it works. They can tell when it doesn't work because in every audience's head is a little model of how stories should work, how to solve problems. If I recall from my time when I worked with you guys there, um, there is a a psychological aspect to it. Am I I correct? Absolutely. Now, I mean, effectively, stories are little models of human psychology. Hmm. And when you look at how characters and plot and theme and genre all work together, they're really basically how we go about solving problems. Characters represent the drive, the motivation to resolve a problem. Plot is the methodology. How do you solve a problem? Theme are the standards by which we evaluate progress. So 
are we doing well? Are we doing poorly? Is this appropriate, inappropriate? And then genre is the overall purpose to which we're trying to solve the problem. Are we trying to lift the spirits? Are we trying to educate? Are we trying to uh, look at something more seriously? Are we just trying to be informational? So it really is th those aspects of story are really just parts of how we uh, think of how our, our own individual psychologies are as individuals. And that's why we are attracted to certain stories and don't really care for others, apart from the storytelling. The storytelling is clearly, you know, subject matter and, and expression are really important to audiences, but underlying that are the more important core elements of meaning, and that's what stories give us. They give us a way to understand our world in a way we can't really see it firsthand um, in our own lives. I really like Chris's point about the empirical nature of a good story. We all, for the most part, know it when we see it or hear it. Technology is a glittering lure, but uh, there's the rare occasion when the public can be engaged on a level beyond flash if they have a sentimental bond with the product. This is the iconic Kodak carousel scene from the season one finale of Mad Men, arguably the best pitch ever delivered on the show, and easily one of the most memorable scenes from its seven season run. And what is at the core of it? Of course, a story. But he also talked about a deeper bond with the product. Nostalgia. It's delicate, but potent. Teddy told me that in Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. And it's a story playing on so many different levels. The slides of Don Draper's family life that he shows have meaning to both him and the audience because they provide a poignant contrast to the mayhem his philandering has caused in his life. You look behind his eyes and you can see he's affected. But we can also see that the story he's telling is having an effect on the men in the room. Harry runs out at the end because it's reminding him of the troubles in his own life. And the men from Kodak are in silent awe. They know they've seen something special, an unexpected surprise when the direction they were so certain was the direction to take has been subverted in a way they did not expect. It's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel. It let's us travel the way a child travels. Around and around back home again. To a place where we know we are loved. And it all hinges on one moving, eloquent, and potently delivered story. When you think about story being a, a core component of the human psyche, it explains why story has been a fabric of human communication and training ever since man walked the earth. Whether it's a business presentation, a situation explained to a friend, a church sermon, or the beginning of a podcast, a good story is always the most powerful way to connect with another human being. Good luck at your next meeting. As filmmakers, we're storytellers. Whether we're telling fictional narratives or documenting some aspect of reality, some of us, like me, earn a living telling the stories that people bring to us. A client has a widget they want to sell. Chris and Karen want to get married and tell the story of how they fell in love. Some worthy cause needs to raise awareness. But when we want to tell stories that don't show up on our doorstep, stories that we seek out and find or create ourselves, where do we find them? I was just saying that I've yet to meet a writer who could change water into wine, and we have a tendency to treat them like that. Not at this studio. That's a scene from Robert Altman's 1992 film The Player. It was an all-star cast led by Tim Robbins as a sniveling and conniving studio executive who, in addition to dealing with murder and mystery, he's also fearing for his job. And in that scene, Larry Levy, played impeccably by Peter Gallagher, is the hot young story executive possibly vying for Tim's job and bringing some fresh ideas on where to find stories. But all I'm saying is I think there's a lot of time and money to be saved if we came up with these stories on our own. Where are these stories coming from, Larry? Anywhere, anywhere. It doesn't matter, anywhere. Um, the newspaper. Pick a story, any story. <clears throat> All right. 
Immigrants, protest, budget cuts, and literacy program. Human spirit overcoming economic adversity sounds like Horatio Alger in the barrio. Put Jimmy Smith in it, and you got a sexy stand to deliver. Inherently, we know that stories are everywhere. But I wanted to get some practical and an actionable advice on finding and telling stories. So I asked this question of friend of the show and frequent guest, Patrick Moreau of the Emmy award-winning studio Still Motion. They have recently launched a new web series called The Remarkable Ones, where they tell the stories of remarkable individuals. People like Dave Jacka, a quadriplegic in Australia that flies airplanes. Or Lek, the elephant whisperer in East Asia or Chris Darwin, the great-great-grandson of Charles Darwin. I wanted to find out how they find and produce these stories and where it all started in the first place. The simple personal kind of early impetus for for the series was that um, at some point a couple of years ago, I'd realized that, you know, I'd been to 30, 40 countries and I felt like I knew very little of them. I knew very few people from them. Um, I knew filmmakers but I didn't really get a sense of like the culture and the place. And it was weird because you'd like meet people at the holidays, you'd you'd meet family and that kind of thing. And you talk about the places you'd been and there'd be this sense of awe. And, but like, I kind of felt like I was misleading in a sense because like I didn't really go there. You know, I went to Singapore and Hong Kong and all these places in a couple of weeks, but I couldn't tell you anything about them because it was for a conference room or in a shoot and you just kind of are in and out. And so the idea was like, how do we take a couple days and really experience the place and the people and do something that's like memorable for all involved. Um, and then kind of out of that and, and brainstorming many different you know, ideas around that came the idea of like, find one remarkable person, tell a really intimate story about them and then give them the chance to you know share what it is that they've learned with the world. And so it's got a very clear uh, focus, it's got very clear value, but it's also a story. So it's not, you know, purpose first or whatever else, but it's a very intimate kind of journey and uh so th- that was the that was really the early idea whenever we're traveling for canon or if we're doing our own workshops or a commercial client can we build in 48 hours and we'll pre-produce before we get there a strong character and just like do it and a separate phone call with patrick he shared some thoughts on where they find these stories one thing is i think you have to always be present they, they happen everywhere in, in our series and just in, you know, everything we've done, you know, some of them have come through Facebook, some are through Google searches, and some are from sharing the idea with a friend, you know, and then going, oh, my God, you have to meet this guy, Chris Darwin, which is exactly what happened. We had a 17-year-old farmer in New Zealand lined up, and then we heard the story of Chris Darwin, got him on the phone, and we're like, oh, wow, we have to, you know, we'll go to New Zealand next time. <laughs> right. Let's pick up this one. Um, so, so realize that there's not kind of one way and you often find, you know, these people through a whole bunch of different connections. But I think that one of the, the strongest things that, uh, that makes a great character, um, in storytelling is what we call their complexity. Um, their, their why, you know, as storytellers, we have to explain their why, why are they the perfect person to go on this journey? Um, and I think that it's looking for, um, that complexity in people in your area that helps you find really strong characters and therefore, stories and and realize that most businesses nonprofits and everything uh good ones exist to solve a problem and so it's often an understanding that connection between their why and then the journey to solve the problem Mm -hmm. that is amazing story so finding people who are doing really cool things a nonprofit, a kickstarter project um just a local business that does something different uh is a is a great kind of uh, seed to start with, but then diving into that and actually finding out who started it and more importantly, why they did it. Is find things that are really neat in your area and then find out who made them and why they did it and see if that in and of itself is the seedling of a strong story because it's got conflict, it's got journey, and it has a great uh, resolution in, in what it is they're bringing to life, whether it's a nonprofit, product, service, idea, whatever it is. This idea of being present is so instrumental in great storytelling, I think. But in today's social media crazed world, it's really hard to be present. My world has become so digital, I have forgotten what that feels like. It was difficult to connect when friends formed clicks. Now it's even more difficult to connect now that clicks form friends. 
That's a clip from the spoken word artist Marshall Davis Jones' TEDx talk, Touchscreen. Marshall was on some of the earlier episodes of our show. Patrick was actually the one who referred me to Marshall in this specific TEDx talk in particular. It's a brilliant performance. But who am I to judge? I face Facebook more than books face me, hoping to book face to faces. I update my status, 420 spaces to prove I'm still breathing. Failure to do this daily means my whole web wide world will forget that I exist. But with 3,000 friends online and only five I can count in real life, why wouldn't I spend more time in a world where there are more people that like me? Wouldn't you? We're all so disconnected from one another, it's hard to be present, even when someone is right there in front of you. Just look around you the next time you're at a restaurant or a park or taking public transportation. Everyone is buried in their smartphones and tablets. I've been at restaurants where I've seen a man and a woman seated at an intimate table, the full moon beaming, Seattle Space Needle romantically lit in the background, and each of them is buried in their smartphone. I've seen groups of teen girls at parties huddled together, all texting, tweeting, and snapchatting away with God knows who. I've often wondered if they aren't actually talking and texting each other right there in that huddle because they've forgotten how to actually communicate with their mouths. And I'm not judging. I'm guilty of this too. My wife has commented once or twice how every time she sees me around the house, I've got my earbuds in listening to a podcast. I can't help but think of the Disney Pixar film WALL-E and how everyone on the spaceship was buried in their computer screens and it took a crash collision between two of them to notice one another and fall in love. Or Spike Jones' film Her from a couple of years ago. Again, everyone connected to earbuds missing the world in front of them. Or this line from Paul Haggis' Crash. It's the sense of touch. I think we miss that touch so much that we crash into each other just so we can feel something. These cinematic examples are haunting allusions to where our society is going, or perhaps we're already there. All of us could stand to be more present. Who knows how many amazing stories are floating by right beneath our noses. But it's one thing to find a story, it's another to tell a story with conviction and authenticity. You can't be a cinematographer trying to film something that you actually don't know what you're talking about or or experienced. That's the voice of Dan Duncan. He's the Atlanta-based filmmaker from Remedy Films, whom we heard from a bit in the Salieri Syndrome episode. The team at Remedy crafts beautifully moving documentaries, and in this conversation, he shared an outlook on his concept of telling authentic stories. In order for me to tell like bring these documentaries that we're making to life like and to to like insert that style like I actually have had to live um, the feelings I'm trying to put into those films and and once you like have experienced those emotions you'll shoot something a certain way and then you'll and then you'll experience it and you'll know that it, it produced a genuine effect. Are you just saying that if like, if I, let's say I'm hired by, um, you know, a church or a nonprofit to create a PSA for getting homelessness, um, are you saying that if I haven't experienced homelessness, I can't tell that story or yes. you see what I'm getting at? You're, yes, yes, you are saying, saying that. Yes, um, I'm saying that. Are you saying, so now are you saying that I can't tell it as well or are you saying I can't tell it at all? No, I'm saying that for you to genuinely tell it like you actually have to know like do your research and take time apart from a camera and go experience like genuinely what that is because the second you put in a like a camera in in that situation like uh i mean it 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 changes everything so you have to experience what that me what it is to be homeless like the my my capstone project for uh being at uga was i did a documentary about homelessness in athens um and that documentary came about not because i would like it was given to me but because there was a, a group of uh there was a place called tent city in athens that i stumbled upon and fell in love with these people and then like and then i left or, or then i then i made a film about these people in that place but I knew that the film was authentic and I knew my style was true to telling the story because I knew what it was like without a camera there 
and I and and it translated 100% versus if someone just was like, hey, I want to tell a story about Ten City, and they took a camera up there, like you're there's just going to be the camera like why did you choose to have a, a stagnant camera movement or like why'd you put a camera on a tripod there when in reality no one in Ten City ever stands still? So why would you give the viewer the perception that there's something is stable here? It's not. So like it's stuff like that that you learn as a, being a part of a, an environment that then you can translate into camera work and into your style uh, that stays, stays true to your story. It seems like something that's not every filmmaker can do. I mean, unless you're doing like a personal project or something like that where you want to, you know, get in and and kind of like, because I hear what you're saying and, and I, you know, I think to an extent, like I agree with you that in order for you to tell a particular person's story, I mean, it almost sounds like what you're describing is method directing. <laughs> if you will, right? Like getting into the head of the subject or... Sure, I mean, and let's, so let's be honest, like yeah. to your point, practically, sure, you, you can't do, you can't maybe experience everything, but you can if, if every project, like I would say that Isaac does this better than anyone I've ever met, like where he like puts his heart and soul into every project, like his name is on it, mm -hmm. versus my, my production company, Remedy, like there's stuff that we put out that, I mean, just to be honest, like, is heartless mm -hmm. uh we did it because we were hired to do it sure. we didn't really know what we were getting into we showed up we we probably they were super stoked with it they they saw it, it was like one like cinematically it looked beautiful um so it, i mean everyone was happy at the end of the day but at the but truly like did we give it the time that it deserved right. and maybe we did maybe we didn't I, like that's where you're getting into being a production company who is churning out pieces versus being an artist who is their, their name is on something and like it's gonna it needs to be perfect before anyone sees it no, and it's no. and it's vulnerable and it's and it you're a part of you is a is in it to you how would you define the hero story like for people out there who wouldn't necessarily know what it means or what it is like, how do you define it for yourself? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess if, if I was to answer that, it would it would really be... Um... That's the smooth, soothing voice of Alex Vo, a gifted filmmaker in Silicon Valley who shoots powerful personal stories in corporate work. We first heard from Alex in the very first episode of The Filmmaker's Journey of Fathers in Filmmaking. In that episode, he and I were discussing Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. A common storytelling structure you find in a lot of movies, most notably Star Wars Episode 4. But I wanted to learn from Alex how he finds heroes' journey stories in the real world. And I guess translating that to uh, short-form documentaries and, and real people, um, I, I do look for that same format because I, I feel like, you know, people that have lived, um, you know, under great circumstances and, and gone through great things, you know, they are, they are personal heroes. and. And, and uh, their stories just, uh, you know, for me, I, I just feel like it needs to be told, that it needs to be heard. Going back to, like, my whole question of, like, is the term story overused? Um, like, when you're... I guess my question is, how do you, like, define that story? Like, like, when, like really, like, practically, like, there's, there's always a cynic, cynical side of me who always looks for the practical like mm -hmm. i'm a sucker for the inspirational quote more than anyone i do a lot of them myself like on instagram that kind of thing oh, but, every, yeah. but every now and then there's that cynical side of me that says okay but practically like what like you know what does that really mean you know, so when you think about story and telling a story like what does that mean like practically if you're the kind of like you're shooting a corporate video for you know acme widgets like how do you what does it mean to tell their story if a company does approach me with a certain product or something that they are looking to sell and I'm kind of promoting that, um, I will I will tend to look for a more personal way of telling that. Well, usually these videos are, are projects that I, I don't normally have on my site because I'm, I'm really kind of focused in the short form documentaries. But um, as far as a corporate level, I, I do look for um, the personal story behind the corporation and behind the product, you know, like 
uh, if there is a product, I tend to search for, you know, how this product came about and, and where where was the need, you know, like uh, where did the need come from in order to, to, to create this product? So in, in a lot of ways, the hero's journey kind of reflects into that too. You know, there, there was a huge need that they, that they wanted to solve. I guess the whole responsibility of filmmaking, of storytelling, really rings true to me where, where I just feel like um, I, I, I'm almost like a voice that translates their story to, a, to, you know, to an audience that needs to hear it. Much like the Force in the aforementioned Star Wars saga, stories are all around us. They surround us. They bind us. They represent the very fabric of culture. No matter what project comes across your desk, if you're mindful present and plugged into the world around you, you will find stories worth telling. And maybe, just maybe, you'll be able to soften the hearts of even the most stubborn cynics. And as they reach for each other... What? What? No, it's kissing again. You don't want to hear that. I don't mind so much. Okay. Since the invention of the kiss, there have been five kisses that were rated the most passionate, the most pure. This one left them all behind. The end. Grandpa, maybe you could come over and read it again to me tomorrow. As you wish. Come, my love, I'll tell you a tale Of a boy and girl and their love story Radio Film School is a production of Daredreamer FM. This episode was written and produced by me with production help from show co-producer Chris Huslidge. Music was curated from freemusicarchive.org and Song Freedom. Check the show notes for links to artists and tracks. My love is like a storybook story It's as real as the feelings I feel You're listening to Dare Dreamer FM, the sound of creative expression. Hmm? Ah! Oh. Podcasts